Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Hope you're all doing well. This day is finding lots of joy for you. I'm up here at Hacienda Rosa today, and just as I'm walking into the forest, I see that we have a hen out. So that's what I'm coming down here to talk about today, this chicken system that we have in the forest here. And uh, so I'm just gonna really quickly catch this hen so she's back in. All right, hen's back in. So, today I'm down in the forest. Uh, this is just below the main house at Hacienda Rosa, which is just up here. So, basically straight up here, uh, kind of above this mango tree, right up there, that's where the house is. So, we're just below the house, and right there, through that little gap there, that's where their, the beginning of their home garden is. So, we're not too far from the house, but we're far enough away that they're not necessarily gonna come here uh, all the time, not gonna walk past it all the time. So this is more of like a zone two, a zone two to three area. Right where we are now, where the chickens are, I'd probably consider a zone two, because typically the chicken systems in permaculture, in permaculture thinking, I don't know if I've actually explained this yet, so let me just do a really quick introduction to zone thinking. So zones are essentially, you can think of as patterns of behavior uh, in your design. So as you're placing elements of your permaculture design or placing elements within your homestead or your backyard garden or, uh, or wherever you're working on, whatever project you're working on, think about zoning as how often and how frequently do you visit certain parts of your areas and how those areas interact with each other. So for instance, with the chickens, we need to come down and check on the chickens about twice a day, make sure they have food and water, make sure they're okay harvest eggs, etc. Maybe once a day if we set up the system right, um, but more likely like about twice a day. So we don't want the chickens so far away that coming all the way down here to get to the chickens is gonna be a hassle. So we wanna make sure it's close enough, but the chickens don't necessarily have to be right next to the house because we don't need to be accessing the chickens that often. Plus chickens are kind of loud and they can be stinky if you don't manage the systems properly. So uh, having your chickens set up so that they're far enough away so that they're not right next to your house and loud with rooster crows and all that and making noises, maybe a little bit of stink, you know? You want them far enough away so they're not right next to your house, but close enough so you don't have to walk so far to get there. So in permaculture, we, we have zones uh, and typically they're listed as zone zero through zone five. So zone zero is usually the household, wherever the main kind of building is, um, whether that be a home or, a, or maybe a farm, uh, kind of a farm building or, you know, whatever you're kind of designing around. Typically zone zero is the place that you're inhabiting or that you're most at, depending on what it is. Uh, zone one then typically tends to be the area where you visit the most frequently, maybe a few times a day. So something, for, in this case, we have the home garden. So right next to their house, they have a home garden. So they can walk down there, harvest greens, check on things, make, thing, make sure things are going well. That's their zone one. So their zone zero is their house, which is just above this mango tree up over the, over the ridge here. And then right down here, that's zone one. Zone zero is the house. Zone one is their home garden, which is right down here, past the tree line here, uh, past that torch ginger. You can see those kind of pinkish flowers sticking up right past there. That's the zone one home garden. And then as we enter the forest down here, we enter our zone two, where we're keeping our kind of forest chickens, the chickens that we're gonna run through the forest to help manage the forest for us, and also help bring fertility to these new, newly uh, made, kind of newly formed garden beds that we made out of all these down trees. So these guys are essentially gonna help us manage the system down here so that we don't get too overgrown too quickly. Right in here is where we wanna build a structure, we're gonna call it the Bosque Bungalow, gonna be just a little kind of uh, screened in, probably a few walls, a little shelter, a uh, small bathroom, uh, a little bit of a kitchen, just so there's somewhere for people to stay who are here long-term helping with the land or coming to take workshops or anything like that. So we have that. So that's the goal. The chickens actually were just in that clearing. They actually started right over here and we moved them twice through this little patch. Underneath here in the tropics, the forest gets really overgrown really quickly. <laughs> So unless we're down here managing it all the time, we just basically lose control. So instead of us having to do that all the time, we're using the chickens to help us. 
to the chickens here, we have a mobile chicken coop. And I've done a video about this, this coop and talked about it, and I'll leave that linked above if you haven't seen it yet. But we have this little mobile chicken coop inspired by Justin Rhodes, uh, the Chickshaw Mini-Me is what this one is based off of, except we had this old garden uh, playhouse kind of roof thing. So we just threw that on just for, cause it's fun, looks kind of cool. And then we had the little zinc paneling there. So yeah, it's a little chicken house. It's definitely pretty heavy. That's the only thing with, because we have this big pitched roof and a little bit extra metal on there, it gets really heavy. So it's not so fun necessarily to, to drag around in here, but we make it work. This will be, this is the chicken area and they're gonna be here for, I think they're in this pen for maybe three or four days at this point, uh, maybe a little bit longer. And what we're looking for before we move them is for them to kind of really get down to disturbance. So you can see right in there, there's a little bit of, they scratch down to the soil level and all the area that's in here is pretty much trampled down and they've taken all the weed pressure off of for us. And now we're ready to move them say to up there where you can see there's much more overgrowth, much more green growth in between everything. So we're gonna actually end up moving them and I'm gonna end up at least attempting to do that today uh, because this chickshaw was not necessarily designed for this kind of uh, deep forest system. I wish we had a little bit bigger wheels so we have a little bit more mobility in here. We just didn't have access to them when we uh, started. So we just don't have those big, big wheels that uh, I think Justin recommends because that would have been much better than this kind of uneven train. But that's, that's no matter. If, uh, if I need a little bit of help, then once Rio gets back from his errands today, he'll come down and help me. And Rio's the son here. So uh, the property is owned by Mark and Monica and Rio is their son. And he helps me a lot down here in the, uh, with all these systems. Really, he's managing the systems and I'm just helping him. So um, yeah, right down here, here's our chickens. So I'm about to move this coop and we'll get into that. And it's a super easy move, super simple. We're using this Premier One uh, shock or not netting, shock or not netting. Uh, basically, it, it, you can electrify it if you want. It's built to be electrified. We're not, we don't have that much of a predator pressure, but it comes with this nice small uh, one inch screening down here, which helps keep the baby chicks in or small chickens in. If you do end up having chicks or anything like that, we can still use this fencing, which is why I like it. Um, and the fact that you don't necessarily have to electrify it and it will still keep everything in. I like that a lot. Super lightweight, super easy to move. Uh, definitely highly recommend it. So moving further into the forest system here. So if we're talking back to the zone discussion, so this is our zone two right around here where the chickens are. And our zone two kind of moves a little bit because we're moving the chickens on a regular basis, but you can probably call the zone two up until a, this little drainage here. So you can see that little low point along here. And this is where a lot of the water drains down and into the forest down here. You can see massive overgrowth up here where we have not been maintaining. And then here where we have been maintaining a little bit, there's still growth, but it's a little bit more managed. So just kind of shows you the difference between management and not management here in the tropics. But right around here is probably the beginning of our, once we cross this kind of drainage that I'm standing in right now, this is probably the beginning of our zone three. So zone three is somewhere where you're, you're going semi-infrequently, you know, maybe you're visiting it once or twice a week, a couple times a week, a few times a week, um, just to kind of make sure everything's still good, make sure everything's going, make sure you don't have any problems, right? So what we have in our zone three here is right now a cacao understory that's nestled into this native uh, tropical rainforest that they have here on the site. So we're basically trying to introduce cacao as an understory uh, product for us. And so that's gonna be long-term. So you don't necessarily have to come and manage cacao trees except to make sure that they're growing well, maybe do some pruning every once in a while, obviously coming to harvest, adding compost, etc. But we don't have to be here every single day like you would in a home garden. So having this kind of zone three long-term uh, crops in your kind of zone three area versus your zone one area, just basically means that you, you can kind of, you're setting up the system so that as you move through it, you're going down to the home garden. So we can, again, I'll go through this, the zones again, right up there, that's the house. You can kind of see it through the trees there. If you kind of know what you're looking for, it might be kind of hard <laughs> here. Not knowing what the house looks like might be kind of hard, but right up there is the house. And then th that's zone zero. So they can walk down there, right over there along their driveway is their zone one. And then right into the forest where we have the chickens over there would be zone two. So they can walk down into the forest and right when they get into the forest, they reach their chickens. And as you move further into the forest, this is what would be considered the zone three. 
So this is the area where it's still forest. We're still coming on a regular basis, but it's just not as frequently as it would be, uh, say, as a zone two or something closer than that. So these kind of zones are, should be thought of as zones of behaviors. You don't have to have your chickens in zone two. You don't have to have your chickens in zone one or your, your home garden probably should be close to the house. So likely almost always zone one, but if for whatever reason that doesn't make sense for you or your, or your, uh, or your system, you might have that slightly differently. But just think about when, when you walk away from whatever your central point is, maybe that's a parking lot if you're not at a home and it's just, uh, it's just the site, you have a parking lot and a shed, that would be your, kind of your zone zero. And then as you move outwards, your general patterns of movement throughout your site. How are you moving? What, which, which directions are you going? Where do you visit most frequently? Where do you visit least frequently? That's how you set up your zone, zone organization. And then once you kind of figure that out and you figure out your movements and how you're, how you're moving through your system, you can start to understand how best to lay out elements in your system. So with the chickens, we want to make sure we have chicken feed somewhat nearby, but we also want to make sure that we protect it from any kind of uh, roaming dogs or anything like that that we have around here in the tropics. So we do want to make sure that's protected. So we might have our chicken feed kind of storage centralized right near the house in like a zone one, and then we might have smaller buckets that we bring out to the chickens in the outer zone. So we can quickly refill the buckets right near the home and then walk down with that. We can also take, say, food scraps from the chickens, walk down through the home garden, maybe pull some weeds as we're walking down through the home garden, and then come down to the chickens and give them food scraps, the weeds, bring the, the food that we're bringing down from our main storage supply down to them. So instead of having everything scattered about where you have to go from my kitchen over to here to my compost bin, then go way over here to my, to my chickens, it's about setting up the system so as you walk through the site, everything's right there for you. Everything's along your path. It just makes your time more valuable or really makes, it limits the amount of, of time you need to spend actually taking care of everything, uh, meaning you have more time to spend on things that are really important. So uh, that's just kind of an introduction to zoning, a basic idea. And basically there's five zones. So we talked about uh, zero through three right now. Four typically is an area where you're only gonna visit a few times a year. Uh, maybe that's a uh, forestry system where you're growing firewood or nut production or something like that, where it's just long-term. You don't have to visit on a regular basis. You're mainly just going out there to make sure everything's in, in place, everything's good, no problems. And then maybe for a harvest every once in a while. And then zone five is considered wilderness. It's an area where you're not doing anything actively. You're not actively intervening. You're just allowing it to be nature and letting nature grow and then learning from nature. Zone five is a very, very important part that a lot of permaculture designers kind of leave out, especially on small sites, I find. Uh, if you have a small site, you can still have room for a zone five. You can leave a small corner of your property where you just have you know, the native plants and everything that grow there and just let them grow because those native plants and those, those kind of those natural things that grow, they're gonna attract all those beneficial uh, native pollinators and insects and everything that you really want flying through your site. So ha reserving a small pocket for that wilderness is really important, is a, is a really good thing to be doing um, in your designs. And I would highly recommend it if you can at all fit some sort of zone five wilderness where you're just leaving wild. Or if you have a big property, just designate an area. A really good idea, especially if you're living on a hillside, is at the top of the hill, just designate that as zone five and leave it because that's going to help protect the upper slopes of your property. You won't have any erosion coming down from those upper slopes because maybe it got destroyed or anything like that. It just kind of protects your watershed as well by having that kind of zone five forested, especially at the top here. So on this property, we have our, a lot of zone five. This is about a six acre property, four and a half to six acres ish. And uh, most of the top of the property, we're on basically a big old top of a hill area. Um, almost all the top, the top of the property we've designated as zone five, so that which is wilderness, we're just letting it do what it wants to do. So just want to come down here. I just I talked a lot about zones so far and all that. So this is our zone three area. So this is a uh, basically forest uh, agroforestry system that we're just essentially just starting here. So this right here, these are cacao trees. So this is where uh, chocolate comes from essentially. So we, these grow up into trees. They get about 20-ish feet tall and they spread out. And so we have, we planted a bunch of cacao. There's one there, all these kind of pink tags you see. There's a small pink tag there. There's one right up there. Here's a cacao here. We planted two along the pathway here. So it'll be nice and easy to show people. 
So this is all cacao and all these trees, I think we planted 11 yesterday. So these trees will take a while to produce, you know, probably three to five years before they're producing fruit. But assuming that everything goes well, right here, this is where they love. They like to be in the forest understory. So we already have a forest here and the understory is semi-clear because of the hurricanes and then we've just been kind of maintaining it. So we're basically taking that area and then we're adding in, introducing species that naturally like to grow in this exact environment. So. We came through and set up a small kind of access idea of a system and this will likely change over time as we learn it and, and actually start interacting with it. But we have our main trail. There's actually a trail right here that just goes through the property. Um, and I think I've taken that, taking you guys on that trail a couple times, but it kind of goes into the forest over there. So that's just for their guests because they have two guest houses on site. So they want to have access for their guests to explore the forest. So we create a little trail system for them. And then right down in here, we have the main trail and then we have just kind of this access trail for us and we have a nice kind of wide trail here so that we can easily get up here to start thinking about harvesting when it comes to that time. We want to make sure that we plan in access while we're designing the system because if we don't do that then when we actually need to start harvesting we're going to have to trample things. So we actually we actually made it quite wide here so that at some point we might be able to fit an ATV, an all-terrain vehicle, or something like that to come in here to help us with our harvest. Um, so we're actually spacing things out probably much more than they necessarily have to be, but that's on purpose in this case. So in addition to planting the cacao down here, we've also planted support species. So this right here, this is an Inga, I believe it's an Inga uh, Vera, I believe is the scientific name, Inga Vera or Inga Vera, I'm not actually sure how you pronounce it, but it's a leguminous, uh, leguminous tree and it produces these pods, these seed pods, pretty big, thick, they turn yellow when they're ripe. And when they fall, you can actually take the seeds, you can open up the seed pod and the seeds have this big white kind of fleshy pulp on them. And you can actually kind of take that and, and uh, put it in your mouth and you take off all the pulp and you keep the seed. You don't eat the seed, but you eat the pulp. And the pulp itself tastes like vanilla ice cream. So they call it ice cream bean. That's what they call it in this tree. It's a leguminous tree. So because it's a legume, it actually has a relationship with uh, rhizobium bacteria that are within the, kind of the root systems. And that rhizobium bacteria plus the trees allows it to help fix nitrogen from the air and put it into the soil and can basically create a nitrogen rich soil ecosystem for us in here. And this is perfect for a uh, productive system. So we're trying to produce cacao and to help help us produce the cacao, we're partnering with the trees, the Inga Vera trees here specifically, to help us by letting them grow with the cacao. And what's nice about that is the Inga is a, essentially a, a support species. It's a sacrificial species. So once it gets to the point where the Inga is kind of overtaking the cacao and maybe causing the cacao to lose production a little bit, we can cut the Inga back. It'll re-sprout, it'll keep growing but it'll then allow us to uh, basically have more light for the cacao trees. And then all that, the cutting that we did are gonna be high in nitrogen because it's a leguminous tree. So we're basically partnering with nature to help us support our tree systems as we get them established. Uh, really big, big uh, important thing to think about in permaculture design. How can you partner with nature as you're doing everything instead of fighting against it? So uh, it seems pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't quite make that connection. Instead of you having to work for everything, work with nature to do it. So yeah, this is our, this is basically a tree line. We have a, a cacao, followed by an inga, followed by a cacao, followed by a tamarind. So this is a, um, another leguminous tree that produces a edible seed pod. Um, here's an avocado just in the middle, just to have something a little bit different. Another cacao here, another inga here, and then another cacao right up there. And then we have a little bit of inga here in between all these other kind of heliconia uh, I think these are like the bird of paradise or something like that variety. And uh, those necessarily, don't, those kind of plants here, they'll stay as the understory until we don't need them and we can cut them and use them as mulch. So we're also partnering with whatever is growing here naturally already and we're allowing them to help be our mulch. So anything we don't necessarily want growing, we cut down and we add it into the beds that we're planting the cacao in. So you can see while we, when we lined, when we made this path, we actually lined both the upper and the lower part with logs that came from the site here. And that allows us to have a nice edge to our garden bed and then also helps keep 
all this material from washing away down the slope because this is on a slope it's a fairly mild slope but it is a slope so we want to make sure that we're keeping everything in this garden bed so you can see here we have an upper line and we have a lower line and then in the middle here you can see we just all of our excess bulk material from this forest we just throw in here and that encourages all this stuff to start breaking down build soil for us we're adding carbon to our soil. We're helping keep the soil moist around the plants that we want to keep in here. And that in the long term is going to help us help give us a very productive ecosystem. So yeah, that's a little introduction to kind of zone thinking and just kind of a, just showing you the cacao trees, our baby cacaos as they're starting to get established. I think Rio planted these ones about a month or so ago. Uh, these two down here so you can see these guys got planted and they're actually all the top leaves here are new growth so they actually put all that all that new growth out since they've been planting so that's pretty exciting uh, i do want to give a shout out to uh jimmy and esther over in rio grande they're the ones who actually gave me the cacao seedling or, or really the seeds they had a cacao that was essentially rotting and all the seeds inside were all basically starting to sprout so last year it was about a year ago maybe a little more than a year I took that cacao, I planted all the seeds, and we ended up getting like 20 or so cacao trees. So we have cacao trees from a uh, cacao, actual a cacao fruit. We took the seeds from that, and now we have more cacao trees here. So really cool to actually be using a uh, Puerto Rico grown cacao uh, lineage. It's pretty exciting for me. And uh, thank you to Jimmy and Esther over there in Rio Grande uh, for providing that for us here. And hopefully in the somewhat near future, in a few years, we'll have some more cacao that we can share with back to you. There's actually a cacao farm right around, right over the ridge essentially. So we're on one ridge here and it kind of goes into a big valley and then up onto the next ridge right over there. Um, there's actually a lady that has a cacao farm and she produces uh, products with cacao, including chocolates and, and uh, and various cacao products and powdered cacao. So that's actually right here in, uh, in Luquillo. So we actually have a local cacao farm that I visited once or twice. I wanna go again and at some point I'm gonna go there and try to do a tour of her property with you guys so you can check out what kind of, what she's doing and the products that she can create from her cacao farm. All right, I just did a lot of talking and I think now it's time to actually do some work. So what I'm gonna do now is move this chicken fence. We're gonna move it. Uh, try to, to try to essentially move up there to reach all these beds that they did not quite get to yet. So right up here, you can see there's more beds here we created with all this downed logs. So this whole area that we're looking at right now, this whole area basically was just down trees and overgrowth about two or three months ago. And we just came down here with a uh, chainsaw and cut up all the logs into usable pieces. And then we laid them out in a way that we can create beds so there's a nice big bed there. We left a nice little access. Again, nice wide access, only because we might want to have you know, like an ATV or something come in here at some point. So we wanted to make sure it's wide enough that we can fit that. And then later we can always shrink or expand the beds if we want to only have a footpath. It's better to kind of be able to do that retroactively instead of having to widen it and get rid of plants. We'll start a little bit wider and then we'll, we'll bring it in. You can see right up here, all this, this is all just kind of green growth that uh, the chickens can come and eat. So basically this is feed for them and then they can help fertilize these beds. And then long term, what we're likely going to be doing down here is some sort of uh, probably ginger, turmeric, sweet potato, uh, uh, taro of some sort, uh, juca here, uh, and a bunch of other things that uh, we could grow in the understory here that are more root crop based. We'll probably use these big old beds for them because they tend to all like being in the understory of a forest, of a tropical forest specifically. And uh, we can use these beds for that nice production. And we're using the chickens to help us have an area that's maintained until we can actually get in here to plant all that and to have the supply to actually plant out ginger and turmeric and all that. We don't have that supply right now. So until we do, we can use the chickens to help maintain these beds and add fertility as they go. Because the chickens are in here, they're scratching, they're manuring, uh, they're moving things around, they're picking up any weed seeds that maybe we don't want in here and finding all the goodness in the soil uh, for them to eat. Partnering with the animal systems, that's what we like to do in permaculture so that we don't have to do as much work and we can let the chickens do a lot of this kind of prep work for us. I'm gonna get started with this and uh, I'll probably stop along the way and talk, but we'll see.
we have it. The uh, chicken's moved. A little bit of a hassle getting that thing in the right position, the uh, chick shaw, but we got it done. And then the fence is now going around this whole bed, just like I wanted it to. It just happened to have just enough. So they'll be able to hang out underneath this mango tree up here. And uh, it basically follows this little semi path we have here, the fence line. So it's easy for us to access and double check while they're here. But you can see these chickens love to be in this kind of nice fresh understory forest where they can go hunting for critters and find all the all the delicious greens, this stuff right here they love, the coitre. This is just like a native kind of growing, growing a little herb here and they love that. So they're gonna come through and find all this delicious stuff. There's a couple mamas trying to lay eggs right around the time I was trying to move them. So I kind of felt bad, but you know, you gotta get this thing moved at some point. So they're just gonna have to deal with it, I guess. And uh, the rooster was all over me the whole time, making sure that I wasn't doing anything weird to his mamas. Right, Rooster? This guy's a good Rooster. He's sweet, very protective, and good to his mamas. All right, guys, that's it for me today. That's a little, uh, this little understory forest work here at Hacienda Rosa. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen these videos at Hacienda Rosa before, I had a few of them. I've, I'm sure I've linked a couple throughout the whole video, so Feel free to check any of those out if you're interested in more and what we're doing up here. Uh, lots of cool stuff going on at this property. And you can actually come stay here. So if you are interested in staying in a, in a tropical, basically a tropical paradise in my opinion, but in a tropical rainforest overlooking El Junque, the, uh, the local actual national rainforest here. If you're interested in staying and uh, checking it all out, uh, check out Hacienda Rosa. It's here in Puerto Rico and Luquillo, uh, about an hour away from the airport. There's about 15 minutes to beaches, 10, 15 minutes, uh, about five to 10 minutes into the rainforest itself. So it's a perfect location uh, here in Puerto Rico. So come check it out if you haven't, if you haven't already thought about it, uh, check it out now. Uh, I'll leave their Airbnb link uh, in the video description below. So feel free to check, click the little show more beneath this video and then there'll be a couple links there. I'll leave their video uh, or the links to their Airbnb rentals down there so you can check it out if you're interested. Uh, other than that, that's it for me. Uh, if you do like what I'm doing, please subscribe to the channel. It helps me get more reach. I'm really close to 100 subscribers at this point. I'm really excited about that. Uh, and uh, if you are watching this in the, in the much later future, then just pretend I'm trying to get to that next 100 and then uh, that's what I'm going for next. But I'm really close while filming this to 100 subscribers. I'm really excited about that day. Um, it's just been about two months of me doing this and it's really cool to already have almost 100 subscribers. So thank you all in my community for uh, subscribing and watching these videos. And uh, please share the videos if you do have any that you particularly like or especially the ones about compost. I'm really passionate about compost and I'd love to have those get out there and into the world because uh, I think anyone can compost and uh, I'm trying to help people do that and help them along their way. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. Until next time, have a good one.